Hello everyone, Adrian here. So, I did touch on this a little bit in my last video, but I did want to make a thorough introduction of it. So I have finally completed my antique couch reupholstery and restoration project, which is super exciting. I cannot tell you how proud I am of the work I've done. <laughs> I've never upholstered anything in my entire life prior to this, and this was a huge undertaking under that consideration, but it was fun, it was rewarding, and I'm really, really happy with the result. So this couch that I am sitting on, I have had since, I want to say, October of 2019, and when I first got it in a thrift store on Whidbey Island, it had a very boring and plain and lackluster upholstery. It was ivory, it had a tiny bit of a floral pattern. It was okay and slightly grandma, but definitely not at the level that I wanted it to be. So when I bought this couch at $150, I decided, you know what? Further on down the road, I am going to restore it and I'm going to reupholster it in red velvet and it's gonna look amazing. And it has finally happened. I have put so much work into this, like I said, and this was a huge undertaking, but again, rewarding. Very, very rewarding in the end. So basically, I wanted to transform it from grandma to gothically glamorous, and I think I achieved that, absolutely. So basically, the first order of business as far as repairs and restoration was concerned was fixing the back left leg because when I initially bought it at the thrift store here on Woodby Island, unfortunately, when the employees were trying to lift it into my car, they didn't lift it quite high enough and the leg snapped off from the bottom like of my trunk. So. That was really unfortunate. I was very upset, as you can imagine. And they wouldn't even so much as offer me like $4 to cover like wood glue to fix it. So that was really annoying. But when I initially got it at the thrift store, it was $150 because it was half off. So it was originally 300, dropped down from 600. So I think they got it from an estate sale. And the way that it was labeled in the thrift store was Victorian parlor sofa and judging by the style and some of the aging I noticed in the woodwork while I was working on it, it looked like it was at least a hundred years old and my friends that I have shown this to to kind of consult them about what era they think this came from, they are thinking very late Victorian if not early Edwardian era. So kind of a transitioning point from the Art Nouveau kind of style which incorporates a lot of organic sort of elements and nature-like elements and transitioning from that into Art Deco. So the Edwardian period is definitely a really good example of that transitioning from one art style to the other. So with Art Nouveau, it kind of incorporates a lot of nature-like elements, like I said, a little more organic, a little curvy, so to speak. And then when you transition into Art Deco, it's a little more straightforward, geometric, a little less curve going on. But when you look at my couch, it definitely has elements from both of those kind of artistic movements. For example, you don't really see much of the back detailing here, but if you look, it has some seashell detailing and it also has some seashell detailing along the bottom as well. So that's definitely a nature-like element, I would say. But at the same time, you also have a lot of these straight edges. And when you look at a bigger picture of the couch, you can see some more curves along the sides. So it's a combination of curvy and geometric. It's a combination of straightforward and nature-like. So that's what makes me believe that it is potentially about 100 years old. And honestly, it's kind of cool to think about because something else I have in my possession that is 100 years old plus is 
a sample of absinthe made in 1900. So it's really cool to have two things now in my possession that are potentially 100 years old. Pretty fucking cool. Now, a lot of people have asked me, where did you learn to basically restore and reupholster this couch? YouTube was immensely successful for looking at tutorials on how to reupholster and restore antique furniture. So if you are curious as to what tutorials and what videos I followed in order to get this restoration done, I will leave those in the description below. So now I will show you the process that went into making this from grandma to gothically glamorous. It went from really plain and lackluster to looking like I'm about to sit down and have absinthe with Dracula. <sighs> All right, so the first step of restoration on my couch here, as you can see, there's the bottom and everything. It's pretty well intact. Unfortunately, I did not find any stamping to indicate what year it was made, but um, from the woodwork in the back, or rather the front section up there, you can see it looks pretty old. But nevertheless, anyway. So the first order of business is to fix the broken leg. Now, if you guys remember from when I first got this couch, um, what happened was as soon as I bought it from the thrift store that I bought it from, they were trying to load it into my car, and they did not lift the back section high enough, and the leg snapped off from the edge of my trunk. So that really sucked. And I was very, very, very upset about that. They would not give me even like five bucks to cover like wood glue or anything like that. So that was so annoying. So that will be the first order of business, and I've already marked the spot where I'm going to drill a hole, and I'm going to put a dowel in to connect these two pieces, and I'll be using wood glue as well. So what I did here is I drilled a hole in this part of the broken leg, and I put a quarter inch wide dowel in here. This will basically help fuse the two parts together. So I've drilled a matching hole over here, as you can see and it's a perfect fit. All that remains now is for me to just uh, glue it in. All right, so my velvet just arrived today, so that means the next step is gonna be stripping off the old upholstery. So the staple gun that I got came with a little staple remover on the end of it. So I'm going to get rid of all these old staples and I'm going to get rid of this trim and the back will be open for us so that we are able to do tufting later with the buttons that I got. So it's pretty, pretty exciting. Ah! Yeah, you guys have no idea how excited I am to finally get this grandma looking fabric off of it and make it look like I'm about to sit down and have absinthe with Dracula. Fuck yeah. So I have completely stripped off the back panel for my antique couch here. So the only thing I'm really leaving behind is this white kind of lining fabric. Uh, and I'm just going to keep that on because it seems like it's in good shape. But the grandma ivory fabric is completely loosened up. So now we're going to turn around the couch and we're going to take all the staples out of the edges of the front and we're going to loosen things up and then we're going to strip it down. It's going to be great. It was actually a lot of hard work to get the staples directly out of the wood here. Dear God, like it was really, really fussy. So I don't know if any of you guys can determine from any of the wood like aging or anything like that how old this uh, couch is. But like I said, if you do have any ideas about how old it is or what period it was made, uh, please tell me. It's obvious from this uh, burlap and this weaving that it was restored rather recently, probably within the last like 40 to 50 years, but it seems like it could be older. I'm just saying. So basically the outside side panel of this is loose, 
So I'm just going to go ahead and take everything off like I did with the back panel here because with this section I will be able to tighten down and fasten down the fabric for the seat part as well as the back part. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So there we have it. I just took the side panel off in one piece and I am going to keep these panels basically as intact as I possibly can so that I can use them as a reference for cutting out the pieces from the new fabric to get stuck on here. And now I'm going to go ahead and peel all of these staples out of here so that we can lay a nice clean foundation for all this. So I have completely stripped all of the staples from the couch and here is the upholstery, like the old upholstery, and then here is the old padding I guess that went underneath. And then below that is the actual like foundation of the couch. So I'm really glad that I actually bought some new foam to go in between the new upholstery and the base I guess, or the foundation for the couch. So I'm going to be working on the, the back panel here and this seating area. And Kenny's bringing me beer. My fancy Rainforest Cafe <laughs> uh, mug, uh, cup. Cheers, honey. Oh, that's good. Mm, it's really good. In case you guys are curious, it's a blueberry lavender beer. It's very good. Cider. Okay, cider. Apparently there's a difference. And pardon her using a mug. We don't have other glasses yet. It's true. We don't other have any other glasses. Other than wine glasses and absinthe glasses. That's it. But anyway, so I'm going to get rid of this old floofy crap. And we're going to replace it with this new foam that I got today at Walmart. And I'm going to do the same thing with the back as well because the back also has this gross, floofy crap and I'm just going to get rid of it. It's going to be great. So yes, I just got out of bed. So now what we're going to do is we're going to basically trace a line on this upholstery foam that I got last night to basically match the shape of the cushioning under the couch. So I'm just gonna use a marker to mark my spots to cut. And then as for the bottom piece that I'm sitting on, I'm just gonna leave that alone and leave it as is. It's fine the way it is. I'm not gonna worry about like cutting it to size because I can always like stuff it and shape it the way I want. So uh, yeah, next order of business is tracing this and cutting it down and it'll be really nice for the padding on the back. So now comes the fun part. We're going to staple the foam in place so that it's ready to go by the time we get the upholstery out. So, uh, I don't imagine we'll need much. Bam! There we are. I don't imagine we'll need very much to kind of basically secure it in place. I'm just going to do it at a couple of long checkpoints over here. So, let's carry on. So I'm going to work 
on patting the bottom as soon as I'm done upholstering the top backing section, but basically this is what I'm going to be using to reupholster this couch. As you can see, it is a beautiful deep red velvet. It is gorgeous and I'm so glad that I picked this out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the original pieces of old upholstery and use them as a guide for making the pieces to go onto the couch. So, oh my god, it's so exciting. You have no idea. But yeah, I'm going to upholster the backing first and then after that I'm going to just honestly just stick the foam on top of the seat that I'm sitting on and then upholster it then. I don't need to do any stapling or anything like that with the uh, foam for the bottom part, but I definitely needed to do it for the back part. So yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get started on uh, cutting these. <laughs> so exciting. All right, so this is the reason why we did not immediately dispose of the old upholstery so that we can basically get a guide for measuring for the new part basically of fabric that's going to go on the backing here. So this, for example, is the backing, and I'm gonna basically cut it around in a rectangle, and I'm gonna leave a few inches for give just in case there's a little bit more than we need. So you know how it is, it's better to have too much than not enough, right? <laughs> so yeah, I'm gonna cut a rectangle around this section to use as a reference, it's gonna be great. Alright, so now that we have the piece that we need cut for the red velvet, we can go ahead and get rid of this gross crap and we can start getting this on the back. Alright, so now comes the fun part. We are going to cover this piece in the red velvet. God, seriously, look how beautiful that is. That's going to look amazing once it's done. Seriously, uh, it's exactly the color that I need for my set. It's perfect. Anyway, but you can definitely get a glimpse of how amazing it'll be once it's done. Anyway, so basically based on all the tutorials that I have watched, they recommend starting from the inside and then moving out each way. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm at exactly the halfway point of the fabric just to make sure it's as accurate as possible. And I'm glad that I accounted for any extra room that we may need because anything that I trim off here after I staple and tighten it in the back I can use for covering the fabric buttons that I'm going to have for the tufting on here. So it's going to be fantastic. Sorry if I'm a little out of breath. I am hot. Really hot. In fact, I'm going to open a window before I start here. So basically, we're going to get it as tight against the wood as we possibly can. And we're just going to go for it. Bam, there we are. We're gonna do it. Ah! All right, so basically I'm gonna pull tight as I staple along the edge here. That's what's, that's what's gonna happen here. Look how beautiful that is. Wow, loving it. Alright, so I have the entire back here stapled in place in the front side, and as you can see, it's fucking gorgeous. I love it. I showed it to Kenny, and he's very proud of the work I've been doing today. This is, wow, I love it. This is so cool. I'm definitely going to go over this with a lint roller as soon as I'm uh, done reupholstering it and everything, but I'm already loving how this is looking. This is gorgeous. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip it around, and I'm going to bring this fabric down in the little opening so that I can tighten it up as much as possible in the back and then staple it to the frame so that we get as tight of a fit as possible. That's what we want. All right, so in this step, basically, we're going to be stuffing any excess fabric 
from the front side to the back side so that we can tighten it and secure it in the back. So that's what we're going to do. All right, so now that I have pulled the excess fabric through the cracks, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull very tightly. I'm going to pull it up like this and I'm going to staple. So that's what we're going to do now. So here's a funny situation. I ran out of staples. So I'm going to be working on some other aspects of the couch until I can get some more staples. So uh, part of what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure out and cut the fabric for the seat part. And then I'm going to measure out whatever other pieces are left over because I do expect some more velvet to come in to complete the rest of the couch. And then I will also work on covering some tufting buttons that I'm going to be working on for tufting the back. And it's going to be gorgeous. I'm so excited. All right, so the last step that I can do for the moment until I get more staples is to work on these buttons. As you can see, I've done all these buttons except one. And I left this last one to basically uh, demonstrate to you how I was uh, covering these buttons. So basically, I got these off of Amazon, and they're just a craft uh, cover button kit by Dritz. So you take your fabric, and then you place the button on top, and then you uh, put the pusher on top as well. So this is gonna sound kind of stupid and look kind of ridiculous, but I'm gonna use the bottom of my uh, water cup to push this baby down kind of get a nice even distribution of weight for that. So that's what it looks like when you push it down into the, I guess the tool that you need in order to do that. I don't know what it's called, I'm sorry. So then I'm tucking all the ends of the velvet in there and I'm placing the backing on top really carefully, kind of going as center as I can. And then again, putting the pusher on top. Give that a good push, nice and tight in there, push it out, and there we have a fabric covered button. So yeah, that's how I covered all these buttons for my couch restoration project. Like I said, unfortunately I cannot do any of the tufting until the velvet on the back section here is as taut as possible, but in a few days I'll have my staples, and once I have my staples we can carry on. All right, so I finally got some more staples for my staple gun, so I'm gonna continue working on my couch here. So basically where we left off is I was about to basically pull as much as I possibly can and get this as tight as possible and just uh, staple in the back. Now, basically what this is, this is the front panel of the seat backing area and you guys probably saw it in the last clip that I showed here, so that's where we're going to start. There we go. I just loaded some new staples in here, so I was being a little stubborn for the first little staple right there, but we're going to carry on. Alright, so now that we have all of this fastened in place in the back, I'm going to go ahead and trim off the excess so that we can see what we're doing with the bottom section here. So this will be fun. Alright, so we're going to apply the same principle to the top backing side as we're going to apply to the seat. And I also did some new foam here and the tighter I pull, the less that this harsh kind of edge line will disappear and it'll kind of round out. So we're going to establish our center mark using the seashell motif down here as a guide. And I'm probably gonna have to use a staple gun upside down again for this part, so wish me luck. Bam, there we have it. So once again, we're gonna be moving from the center outwards, so that's what we're gonna do. So as you can see already, the 
edge of the new foam that I put under here is going to round out the tighter that I pull this. So trust me, it'll, it'll help. There we go. Basically, I had to tighten the tension on my staple gun just a little bit to kind of get it to go through a little more strongly. So that's what we're doing. But we'll get there. This will take a little bit of uh, muscle and precision, but I think we can do it. All right, so I have fastened the front seat area of the couch and I have tightened it in the back very, very tight. That was a little bit tougher than I was anticipating, but we're almost done with the upholstery part. So after we're done with the upholstery part, we'll get to move on to the tufting and I'm very, very excited about that. So basically what I'm doing here to complete the seat section is I'm tugging, I'll move so you can see, is I'm tugging again as tight as I possibly can and then stapling in place. So just like with the other sections, I'm gonna be pulling tight in the middle and snapping it in place. There we go. And then moving outwards. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna work on the inside and outside side panels right here. So uh, forgive the little staining right here, but honestly, it's just the little lining foundation part of the couch. So I'm not worried about staining since it's not gonna show up on top. We are going to fasten this part to the inside panel with, of course, the staples. And then we're gonna pull it through the other side and tighten it that way. So that's the next step. All right, I have it pulled through the back and the bottom. And once again, we're gonna do our, basically our center. Okay, looks like I have to do this upside down too. That's great. Oh well, we'll work through it. Okay, so now that we have half of the top stapled in, I'm gonna go for the bottom, or rather the side right here, going downwards. Okay, so I got as tight to the frame as I possibly could, so now I'm gonna trim away the excess with Kenny's very handy uh, fabric scissors. So now I'm gonna work on stapling the other side and I'm gonna tighten it down and tighten it in the back as well. All right, so now the inside right panel of my couch is completely secured, covered, and fastened in place. So now we're going to cover up this side panel with this piece of velvet and that side will be totally done and I'll do the same thing with the other side. I will admit this side is gonna be a little tricky, but I think we can do it. I had to get one of Kenny's uh, sewing pins over there just to keep this part up so I can see what I'm doing. All right, so we have our first staple established over here. So I'm just gonna staple a few more across before I take out Kenny's little fastening needle here just so I can get a good idea of where I'm going. All right, I have the outside and inside side panels on the right side of the couch done. Unfortunately, this part took way longer than I expected it to just because I could not get it at a good angle on the staple gun, unfortunately. But the inside and outside side panels are done. I'm so happy. This was probably the hardest part that I've had to do so far. Uh, staples look a little wonky right here, but honestly, I'm not too terribly concerned about it because we're gonna be covering those up with the lovely wine colored trim that I got. So I'm gonna do the same thing with the other side, and then I'm gonna do tufting on the back seat section, so it's gonna look lovely. I'm really excited. All right, so I was going to use upholstery thread to do the tufting here on the couch, but unfortunately it was too thin and flimsy to handle it and to basically create resistance in the back with the burlap. So I ended up making strips of scrap velvet that was left over from um, upholstering and stapling everything. And I made these ribbons to basically hold these buttons in place in the back and I tried this last night and it actually worked so I was really really happy about that. So what I'm going to show you is how I did it. I already did um, the rest of the couch here but I'm going to be doing this 
over here for you guys for demonstrational purposes, so that's what's happening here. So first I'm going to show you what it looks like from the front with what I did. So I'm going to start with inserting my needle in the spot that I need. And I'm going to get it just enough so that I'm able to still insert my ribbon through the eye. And I'm going to slide my button kind of toward the end so that I have enough give to pull the needle through. And since this is a bit tricky, I usually recommend uh, using pliers to kind of push it and pull it through, so that's what I'm going to do. So if I notice that the other end is going to disappear through the rabbit hole here, I'm just going to go ahead and pull it back through the front a little bit so that there's still a little bit of give here. And I'm going to pull the other side through. Fantastic. So you have the button hanging here, so I'm going to pull the thread through so that I have enough room to basically pull the other half through and tie it off at the back. So once again, I'm gonna insert it into the hole and try really hard not to uh, puncture the other ribbon here. Okay, I've made it through the back. And now I'm gonna take my ribbon and once again, insert it into the eye. and then push this bad boy through. This part can take a little bit of muscle, so be mindful of that. And we got it. Bam. We have it threaded through and looks good. We have our little tie-off section in the back. So for tying it off, what I like to do is I like to basically even out the threads in the back. Again, I'll, I'll show you a back view of this. So I like to push the button as much as I can and then tie it off in the back. All right, there we are. So that's how you do the tufting in the front. And in my next shot, I will show you how I did this from the back. All right, so I'm going to show you a back view of what I did just now. So we're going to go through the hole. As you can see, this is a very big needle. Please be careful when using these, dear God. So threading the ribbon through the needle and giving it a good tug. Then we're going to pull this back through so that we have enough give. Then threading the ribbon through the eye of the needle. And then giving it a good tug. So we have the tail of our button here. We're gonna pull and then push through the front as well so that it doesn't snap off from the pressure. Because trust me, I've had that happen several times. It's not been fun. I'm gonna tie, pull, push a little bit, pull again, and double knot it. There we go. That's how you do tufting. And that's how I've been doing tufting on this couch since the upholstery thread was just not enough.
right guys, so that was the entire process of restoring and reupholstering this couch. As you can see, like I said, it was a lot of work. It was definitely a little rough on my hands, <laughs> I will admit, but again, so rewarding to find something in an antique store or a thrift store. It's Part of it is the thrill of the hunt. The thrill of the hunt of going into a thrift store or antique store and finding something that is gorgeous from an era that you absolutely love. And then there's the thrill of basically customizing it and making it your own. It's really, really cool. So I did want to give you a breakdown of the cost of making this couch. So the couch itself was $150. The velvet was $31. I had to buy four yards of this red velvet, which totally worth it. And I got that from Amazon. The trim that I used was $16. The wood glue was $4. The staple gun was $13. The staples were $5. The buttons I used were also $5. The tufting needle set was $12. The needle nose pliers that I got were about $5. And the wooden dowel that I got, which was a pack of 20, which was way more than I needed, <laughs> was about $2. And the drill that I used was donated from my dad. So basically the last time we went to Yakima, I said, hey dad, I'm working on this restoration project. I would really like to use a drill. So thankfully he had an extra one and he let us have it. So that was really, really nice of him. So when you take all the costs that went into making this couch, it came out to be about $243 to restore this couch, including the expense of the couch. Obviously, the biggest part of that chunk of money is going to be, you know, the actual couch itself, which I bought. And the rest of the materials and everything like that really didn't cost me that much, which is pretty great. And once again, I do want to say it is super rewarding to find something that you like and then customize it to make it your own. Uh, when I showed Angela pictures of this, she said, oh my God, it doesn't even look like the same couch. And I'm like, yeah, and it's wonderful. And it feels a lot more me. <laughs> you know, it fits in a lot more with my Victorian, like elegant Gothic style that I like and like to emulate here on my channel. So I like to incorporate both the kind of gothic style as well as Victorian style and a little bit of elements from the Bennett book sort of era because it's elegant and it's beautiful and I can't escape it. <laughs> so I also just want to point out to you guys that it is a lot more cost effective to find an antique or something in a thrift store and basically redo it yourself as opposed to going online and buying all of this expensive and sometimes tacky gothic furniture that they have online. And honestly, if something that is 100 years old is holding up better than something that was just made, then trust me, you're getting your money's worth and more when you get something that is an antique and restore it yourself. So I do want to encourage you guys to if you have thrift stores or antique stores in your area, please go scour them. You never know what you're going to find and don't take something for granted just because it doesn't have nice upholstery. You can always change that, just like I did here. And you're gonna have a lot of fun. Seriously, it is a lot of fun. Trust me on this. So guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please give it a like if you did. And if you haven't already, please subscribe and turn on the bell for notifications. And of course, there will be more content coming on absent education, gothic literature, gothic music. I recently caught wind that one of my favorite gothic musicians of all time has come out with a new album. So that's definitely something I'm going to review for you guys because I'm thrilled. I'm absolutely thrilled. Thanks so much to my patrons. As always, your support is so appreciated. And everyone, thank you so much. I love you, and I'll see you guys later. Bye.